<clears throat> okay. Welcome. <laughs> this is going to be one of the most, um, it's kind of like a, a little bit like low profile type of presentation because we're here to talk about online infrastructure. So it's not like as Blender as it gets. It's more like as everything that is not Blender as it gets. Um, so we start with a little bit of a you know anecdote, a little intro about where uh, you know we come from and what this is uh, all about, uh, and then we actually get right into the uh, into the talk. So uh, this thing, well, um, we don't need we don't need sound actually. It's okay. It's better without sound. Yeah, it's actually better. It's, this is it's found footage <laughs> from 2014. So this is uh, at the Anthropodoc, so the, the place where uh, originally Blender Institute was established. And, uh, <laughs> and this was a day uh, where we, uh, so me and Pablo were working there uh, after doing a few uh, open movie projects and uh, we were sanding the floor together with Ton. And so we had to remove all the furniture and all the computers. And so we were staying there at the time. Um, so in the evening, there was this big empty space, and then we were like, ah, let's just uh, play some football. And uh, that's basically how you know, we, we started collaborating on uh, different type of projects uh, on, on the web. So we needed to build stuff for, for the Blender project online. Uh, and so we went through a, a, a few of these kind of projects, like the Blender Network, uh, which was an idea to connect Blender professionals and Blender educators. It was a little bit ahead of its time uh, as a project. And uh, we actually ran this for a few years. Uh, we worked on the Blender Conference website. The one that you are seeing today is probably the third, fourth iteration of that. Uh, but originally, Blender Conference was hosted on Blender.org, so it would just be a page on the Blender.org website slash conference. The schedule used to be a spreadsheet that was screenshot in PDF format and uploaded to the website. There were like, you know, one room where the presentations were happening, then two. So it was manageable, and, and Ton was doing all of that by himself uh, with the help of a couple of people. Uh, so then both me and Pablo were very motivated to take over these things and try to make more. So we made a new version of the Blender.org website using uh, WordPress, for example. And uh, at some point, uh, we also did the Blender Cloud. And uh, that was a, a big, kind of a big turning point because obviously uh, this website was actually meant to make money. This website was meant to provide uh, financial support to the activities of the studio. So there was like a lot of things connected to that to make sure that people could sign up, have access, have access to the content. I started doing that by myself and then Pablo joined the, the team for the Gooseberry project again. And we designed and redesigned and remade this website a bunch of times. And the crowdfunding. And the crowdfunding part, of course. And, and of course like this, you know, again, I'm talking about what we are doing. Like we worked on Attract, we worked on Flamenco. We did a bunch of stuff until one day there was a, a lot of things, uh, which is what we are gonna talk about today. But this was not possible. Obviously this is not something that we did by ourselves. So this is something based on work from others in the past, lots of contributions, lots of help. Uh, so obviously take this uh, with that uh, context in mind. Um, so that being said, I wanted to, I'd like to go over a couple of things uh, here, like what is the, the goals of the presentation. Uh, it's to share how uh, we are uh, organizing these projects and to show potential ways to get involved. And uh, that's about it. And before we say more, it's like, okay, but why are we doing it like this, right? Like for a project like Blender, there are ways there is a lot of infrastructure today online, uh, commercial projects, uh, platforms that people have figured out uh, to, to facilitate development or to facilitate making a conference or to facilitate publishing stuff. There's a lot. Uh, very well done, very polished, very highly functional websites <laughs> that allow you to do this kind of thing. So why do we wanna do this ourselves? Well, to begin with, uh, it's important that Blender has a, the, all this online uh, infrastructure because it's uh, uh, collaborative by nature. So Blender started as an online decentralized project. 
And so it always needed ways for people to come together. It started with IRC and it started with a projects website where people could just publish the code and share the code, review and leave comments and forums and stuff like that. Um, so this is like very much embedded in the, you know, in the, in, in the nature of the Blender project itself. And uh, of course, to be aligned with Blender using free and open source software, that's a natural choice. It's very important to stick to that. Uh, it's not always easy and it's not always possible. It's more like hard than impossible, uh, but we try. So like one recent example, you know, that sparked quite a bit of debate and a lot of uh, like introspection about this was when we were doing the uh, Gitia, right? Projects of Blender.org, awesome. It's like, it's like GitHub. It's like, well, you know, GitHub, you know how big GitHub and how well made of a product it is. And then we, we're busy making Blender. We have to make this work for ourselves so that we can self-host it, self-manage it. It's free and open source software. We are in control of it. And that way Blender can be available for everyone. Yes, it's a great idea, but in practice, it required like quite a massive effort to migrate this data from the previous website where everything was to the new one and making sure that the new website actually works and delivers at that level because that's what people expect, right? You expect to have something that behaves like GitHub. If you said it was like GitHub, so why isn't it like GitHub? So that's uh, uh, always uh, a challenge. So that being said, yeah, you want uh, to? Just, just to add on to why that, that is another reason that it's part of the why. It's that we were actually using open source software before. It was Fabricator uh, maintained by Facebook, but they stopped maintaining it. And we have to move to something else that is actually actively maintained. So that's another reason of the why getting involved with developing the software and helping develop the software that we are making. Yeah, yeah, and uh, it, indeed, like a note about the Facebook, it started as a Facebook project and the developer at some point went independently and he maintained it for a while, like as a community effort, but uh, as Pablo mentions, it's hard to keep momentum on these projects and to keep them going and to keep people engaged. So it's, uh, uh, in the end, the project right now is inactive, so we had to uh, move on basically. And we think that, uh, for example, for, for Githia, there is a lot of promise, there's lots of potential, but uh, that's one of those things that having people involved to help would be really, really nice. Um, so talking about the goals and values, like for what, what is it that makes a piece of our infrastructure, it has to be free and open source software. Like we really do not, like if we do use tools or things that are considered not free and open source, it's, not some, it's something that maybe we use uh, internally or for some specific tasks, but it's not something that is uh, offered for the community. Like, because the idea is that anything that the Blender project does, anyone in the community should be able to check it out, modify, try it, run it, contribute to it, and that's like super important. So anything that is done, is done that way. Uh, Self-hosting is a very big uh, factor, is a very big, very important dimension of the way we work, um, because we do self-host pretty much everything or we try to self-host as much as possible. So self-hosting means that you run the infrastructure to provide a specific service or website yourself. And this can be done at different levels. Um, it can be done just with virtualization. So for example, you could have somewhere a, a service, a commercial service that provides you a virtual machine where you can run things. Uh, but in, other, in our case, often it's like we even have the hardware. We even have like the hardware level. So in a data center somewhere, we actually have computers that run virtualization layer on top of which we run uh, the websites and the services that we, that we provide. And um, so that's like a very important uh, uh, side of this. And uh, uh, of course, like what I mean with tailored to fulfill our needs is that we, uh, I mean, this is a thing that I believe in a lot. That's something that I'm lucky to have Pablo to be aligned with as well. And we really try our best to make things that are tailored, like designed for the purpose. Because you can easily take websites and hack them around or frameworks and hack things around to make it look like or make it work like you want. And we try to do it like right. So we try to really make it to, to answer questions. Like uh, uh, an example is we at some point built this uh, ideas platform, like right click select um, based on uh, something we built before. And like there are many ways to make this already today, right? You just make a forum with upvotes and you can do it. But you're like, okay, let's just actually build something specific for this that people can ask their question. You can manage the upvotes, you can see who's upvoting. There is a lot of specificity to these issues. And the more you can address them with your product, the better experience you're gonna have, in theory. In practice, it's very hard to then maintain 20 different websites that do 20 different super specific things, but that's why 
help is welcome. Um, this uh, chart shows a little bit of the kind of ecosystem, the landscape of websites that there are around Blender. So you see Blender at the center and uh, uh, in a concentric, like the closest ones are things that are really key, they're really core, they're really vital to Blender, right? The project's website, the download, you can't download Blender without download the Blender.org, or Blender.org itself, like you can't go on Blender and download it if you don't have the website. So some of these things, if they weren't around, it would be pretty difficult for Blender to function, to exist, to be popular, to be discovered. Uh, the chat is important because people communicate through it. Uh, but then you get a little bit more outside and uh, you get something more like a conference or like communi other communication platforms, the code blog, so, but still important things to share. Um, platforms to translate, for example, the builder, the delivery pipeline, it's a list of things. A little bit wider, you get the archive, you get the development fund, you get the Blender Studio. These websites, while they're not like core of making Blender, uh, some of them are pretty much important for its financial sustenance, like the Dev Fund and Blender Studio. They are the websites that are used to collect donation and funding for the Blender Studio and the Blender development projects. And these are websites that we built ourselves. Uh, the Dev Fund in particular, it's fun because uh, it really started as a, like, there was nothing first. There was like just a simple PayPal button, PayPal donate button uh, before the 2.8 uh, uh, CodeQuest project. And then we thought, okay, we really need to make this a bit uh, more functional, more interesting. And that's when then we built the entire, uh, the entire website that you know today with the badges and with, with the donation, the different payment methods and so on. And we are working now to make it even better uh, because the easier you make it then for people to, to give you something, then the more likely it is that it actually happens. But these websites are super important, but they're not as close as, you know, things that you need to have you know, Blender functioning with. And then more around the video, for example, where we, uh, you know, it's a PeerTube instance where we publish videos. Uh, the Blender UI, there are some websites that you probably never even know they existed. Uh, there is open data for the benchmarking and so on. So like, this is just to show you it's a gradient of things. And also when in our work and in our way of handling and asking for contributions, then we look at this from this point of view, like what is really essential, what is less important. So like there are projects that are less high stakes that you can contribute to without feeling like, oh, you know, but you have to go through, I don't know, weird reviews or weird requirements to contribute something. Some, some things are like very, very easy to, to get into. Um, this is called, like you can consider it's almost like an infrastructure of websites because they're connected with each other, but they are built on top of any infrastructure. So infrastructure means like, what are the, the foundations of this? And, uh, uh, I, I'm name dropping some tech that maybe some people know. So it's more for technical interest for people that know these kind of things. Um, a lot of the infra runs using Linux and FreeBSD. Uh, a lot of things are running based on Proxmox V, which is like a virtualization environment, as I was saying. So you don't just have a computer that you turn on, install your software and run it. There is like some wrappings around to keep it safe and to keep it managed. Um, PFSense, it's uh, a thing for load balancing and uh, firewalling and network traffic analysis and protection and so on. Uh, Ceph storage is a system for managing storage in a flexible and scalable way. You can think of it uh, similar to a block storage, uh, to, to, to object storage like S3, but more, it, it can do lots of different things. Um, and a data center rack. So what I mentioned much earlier is that we actually have our own uh, hardware and that needs maintenance. So while you may not have to go and pay the, the AWS, like the Amazon data center fees for hosting a computer, you need to buy hard drives. So you have to buy a thousand euros of hard disks every few years to make sure that your data stays safe and so on, right? So there is still a cost to do these things, but then you, are, you have more control over how those things are set up. Uh, this infrastructure is managed uh, almost full time by a, a small team of people. Um, which is mostly uh, Dan and Arndt. Uh, you can find their names and their contacts on the infrastructure uh, uh, projects of Blender.org and they are online, they're in the chat, they are uh, available. Just want to give them a shout out because without their work, everything that we built on top would not be possible the way it is. Um, do you want to talk about the off-the-shelf things? Mm -hmm. Hello. Well, off-the-shelf are just software that we basically just download and start using. We hope it would be that easy, but it's not. 
Um, BuildBot, it's a software that is used for the, for the build, uh, builder.blender.org, which is not only daily builds, but every time a developer has to test that their patch works, has to go through the, the BuildBot, and that is one of the, the pillars of what keeps Blender running. Or not, we find out when it's not running, thanks to that website too. Rocket Chat powers Blender.chat, unfortunately. This course is DevTalk, the DevTalk forum. It's, uh, yeah, it's just for communication and um, it works okay. Git, it's the, it's, well, Git is the project we're using, but we have a branch with some changes that are not on mainstream yet, but that's a goal to uh, push, to do some research and push some of those changes upstream. MediaWiki for the, for wiki.blender.org, we might be switching to something else in the near future. Ugo and BytePress, it's kind of the, how, where we could be going in terms of the documentation for, uh, is right now it's used for the Studio Pipeline website, which if you haven't checked, highly recommend, studio.blender.org slash pipeline. WordPress powers blender.org and the code blog. On top of WordPress, there is also ACF, Advanced Custom Fields, which allows us to make the website a bit more interesting without having to code too much. WebLate is a new project, uh, the, the new project in Blender.org that is uh, hosted in translate.blender.org, where you can see where your language is at. Uh, you can see today I was showing that uh, Spanish is 96% in the UI, but the, the manual is 48%. So I did some finger, finger yeah, pointing. Um, Plausible is the, the software behind analytics.blender.org. That's one of the big things we did this year is to get uh, go away from Google Analytics and host our own. So uh, you shouldn't see any more Google Analytics, no more like cookies, weird things going on on the Blender.org websites. Now we host our own. And uh, what I mean, one of the reasons is because it's open source, but also because we don't need all the kind of weird tracking that um, Google does. We like just, we're getting the visits where people are using and how many downloads. There are, of course, we, um, we well, we named it analytics.blender.org because most um, uh, ad blockers, they ignore that website. So actually, if you go with an ad blocker to blender.org websites, your visits don't get registered because of analytics.blender.org. Um, Grafana is used for metrics.blender.org, which is a website also not many people are aware of, but it has some numbers regarding the commits, the high priority bugs that are in currently in Blender and some more metrics in the future. Peertube, it's video.blender.org. That's a website that it's maintained by itself. It's no, 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 itself. We have, I'm um, uh, <clears throat> forgetting his name already, but he uh, takes basically all the videos that uh, we Larry. are host on. Eh? Larry. Larry. Yeah. Uh, from YouTube, from our YouTube channel, and then puts them on Peertube, on, uh, on video.blender.org, which is federated, so everybody has access to it. And that's it. Yes, okay. So just one, a quick, uh, a couple more things about uh, uh, development itself, then, you know, we are here mostly to do a little Q&A for the people who survive this. Um, so we do some bespoke development, as I mentioned, right? Because of course we try to use, that's just to show you that we look around before developing something ourselves, try to use our you know, brains and be like, okay, has this been done before? Because probably it has. Um, but then sometimes we have to make something ourselves because it's gonna be simpler, easier to maintain, very specific use case. So, you know, very often it's just easier to develop a couple of functions for yourself or what you need than to get a multi-dynamic AI framework that is supposed to be able to do everything and then it does the thing that you want only 50%. Um, back in tech, you can see it, Python, PHP, and Go, a lot of uh, PHP for uh, historical reason and ease easiness of deployment. Uh, Python is very well uh, uh, spoken by a lot of uh, Blender developers as well. So it's like a very common language. A lot of people know it. Yeah, it's also inside of Blender. Uh, Go is a little bit more recent, but it's appreciated for the portability, so building things that are like easy, again, easy to deploy, and uh, it's a very robust language to nice. build applications with. Benchmark? Uh, well, yeah, we, we used it for, for the Flamenco website, for, for Flamenco itself as an app, and also for the Blender benchmark uh, runner uh, that's done with, uh, with Go. Um, for the front end, we have a, a SAS bug and JavaScript, and JavaScript in this wider sense. So like the sense of its ecosystem and a lot of packages, a lot of tools. Uh, there is a lot of, 
nuance and difference in how these, still, these tools are used depending on the websites. For the front-end part, Pablo can spend a few words later. And uh, uh, for frameworks themselves, um, Django, Vue.js, WordPress, and Web Assets, those are like the things that we use a lot to build things from scratch. Uh, Django is a uh, uh, Python um, web framework. This is very, very one of the most popular and uh, well-established Python web frameworks there are. Uh, out there, and we use it to do a number of websites that we're going to uh, walk through now. Vue.js is a JavaScript front-end framework, and uh, WordPress, you might have heard of it. It's uh, very versatile as well. Uh, it can be, it allows you to turn your blog into a CMS, which is essentially what we did with Blender.org. And Web Assets is a uh, front-end framework made by, uh, originally by Pablo and maintained by a couple of people uh, to try and give a coherent look and feel to uh, a lot of our applications. And uh, to run quickly through these things, um, I want to, uh, this just to give you an example, because you know these things, right? You know the Blender ID, it's a centralized authentication system uh, for all the, uh, for, for a lot of Blender websites. You log in here with one account, you're able to log in everywhere. So like making this work, it's obviously not super trivial, and, uh, but we really like that kind of uh, experience that if you want to contribute to Blender, you just need one account and then you can log in everywhere. Uh, the Blender conference, you may have seen it. This is uh, done with mostly just Django and uh, of course a bit of uh, front-end coding. Uh, and uh, do you use web assets for this? Yeah, yes, well, okay, so web assets. And uh, uh, open data, this is like a more complicated thing because it has the online component and offline component because it's a benchmark runner that you can run and publish benchmarks over, but it works the same. Again, it's like it's very similar. You can see also a bit in the design, in the design language, there is some similarities. Uh, development fund is a website we are working on currently to, uh, to make something that goes beyond what we have here. But this is very cool because this website actually has been used by the Krita project. So if you go to fund.krita.org, you actually find a very similar version of the website. And the same kind of design language and metaphors have been adopted also by Godot. So if you go to fun.godot.org, while they are not exactly running the same website, the spirit, the idea behind this is basically uh, there as well. And we are very proud and we're very happy that people take these ideas and they bring them further in their, uh, in their communities and their own ecosystem. So that's very, very cool. And uh, uh, this is the Blender Studio, which is also uh, done in a similar way, and it's our own self-hosted, uh, self-made uh, self website uh, for allowing artists to publish and share the work that they're doing as part of the studio and give value to the people who sign up to the platform and support it. And uh, for the front-end development. Ah, yeah, that is Web Assets. It's a, well, it's based on Bootstrap, so it's very similar. The, the, the class naming is very similar. It's just an extension of, uh, of well, basically it's what, what keeps all our websites looking similar. Based on Bootstrap and using a, a Fontello, I don't know if you're familiar with it, it's a, it's a website where you can make your own fonts and just by putting things together like a Frankenstein font and uh, it's pretty cool. And there is a screenshot which has the, a bit of the design system. So what was it is a, a, you can clone it from the projects of Blender or their website and run with NPM. It's very simple, but it gets you up and running. This we consider products. So these are the, the, the mindset that we have when building and designing these things is like for Blender. It's a product, you are meant to have a user experience, you're meant to have a user story. We treat it as products. It's not just a, you know utilitarian infrastructure for us, especially the way we think and we build it. So if you think like this and if you like these kind of things, then you're very welcome to uh, get involved and contribute to these projects because that's like a way of thinking that we appreciate a lot and that, we, that helps these experiences and websites to be as good as they uh, can be. So thank you for your attention. And uh, if there are any questions, we are happy to answer them. Otherwise, we can, of course, like wrap it up and talk one-on-one. -on -one. So however you like. Thank you. OK, there is one question over here. Mm -hmm. So the question is about ongoing projects, what is high priority, where help is more welcome than others. I mean, I guess it depends a little bit also on the area of contribution. So if you are doing, for example, backend development, so you're more like for server side of things and uh, things like that, there is, as you know, from software development, 
there is always the concept of technical depth and things that are like falling behind and getting bad all the time. With web, it's even worse because there is usually security risks involved. So you need to keep things up to date, uh, not just on the infrastructure level, but even on the applications themselves. So there is a lot of those things like that is pure maintenance that is just like in a way relatively low stake is just effort because you have to download the website, run it, figure out if I update this library, what's going to happen? And then, you know, that's, that's like a big thing that is, it can be done on any, uh, on any basically website that we have and is very, very welcome because it's a lot of effort. It's the same for Blender too, by the way, like Blender has uh, lots of challenges with its, uh, um, with the, with the library maintenance, like making sure the libraries are up to date, they compile that they run. It's a thing that we struggle to find maintainers, uh, platform maintainers. So for web is basically the same situation because it's a not so glamorous job that, you know, people, you really need to be passionate about it. We do it because you have to. So that's also why we do it, right? Uh, but yeah, so that, that's an idea. When it comes to front end and front end design and things like that, that's a little bit more involved, right? It's the same way as doing Blender user interface design. Well, then you start to have opinions, so that's more about communication. So being able to share your vision, share your idea of how something should be done, both on a design point of view, but also then on implementation. Because, you know, designing, it's already hard, but then you have to make it too. So that's like, I would say that that's more difficult. Um, so yeah, I hope that that gives you a sense. Okay. I think we should wrap and then, you know, thank you guys for coming. This was, I'm sure, not what you expected. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. On the list of projects, actually, there was one project that it was mentioned here in the, I think it was. Are you looking like, for the extensions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The extensions, and it wasn't mentioned. And it's actually kind of related to online. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a project that was announced last year. And it's been, we've been working on it. Actually, there is a, uh, a post on the code blog and that is still ongoing. So it's not like we forgot about it. It's just still ongoing. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of the conference. Yeah.